So, uh, new words and some new metaphors for, um, oh, look, there are my speaker notes. That goes over. Make that full screen. And very, very nice. Look at that. We only wasted like five minutes. Which is, there it is. Good. All right. Back on track. Totally. Um, so, yes, some new words and some new ideas about some familiar words. Uh, some new metaphors for thinking about Drupal and really systems in general. A belief that Drupal's complexity can be mitigated, uh, but also you know that doing so is really paramount to the health of the project. And that doing that work, reducing the complexity of Drupal, is Drupal's highest calling. It is the thing you should aspire to when you have mastered all of the other things, and maybe before. Uh, honestly, this is, this is uh, also kind of implicitly, I mean, I don't have it on the slide, but this is also a talk about what's killing Drupal. Um, there are a number of prominent community members who have left over the years because of the basic issues of complexity that Drupal has. And my goal is to kind of try to help us get a handle on them, understand them, think about them better. Much of this talk is really happily and proudly stolen from this talk by uh, Rich Hickey, who's the creator of the language Clojure. Uh, the talk's called Simple Made Easy. Can I just get like a show of hands? Yes, he's amazing, and so is Clojure. Thank you, Stephen. A uh, show of hands, who's heard of Rich Hickey or seen this talk? Cool, all right. Um, so this talk's amazing. Uh, it's not redundant to see that talk after you've seen mine, like the base definition's the same, but uh, uh, he goes some very different directions. His talk basically amounts to an argument for why you should only use functional languages. Um, so that's not very useful for this crowd, so I've readapted it. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I strongly encourage you to look at that talk. It is, it is really, really quite, quite good. But um, he starts his talk, as will I, by talking about word origins. Uh, so, some etymology real quick. Two words, simple and easy. Simple comes from the Latin simplex or simplus. Simplex means really like quite literally, the two parts of the word mean one fold or braid. Its opposite, of course, is complex. Uh, and when we say one fold or braid, this can be a little bit, you know, sometimes people picture something which is like folded once. What this is really expressing is unarity of, of the thing, so it's unfolded. Think about like, you know, we have duplex apartments, that means they have two levels, so simplex is one. Uh, easy. Easy is actually a little bit harder to derive good definitions, good good uh, etymologies for. Uh, I have two up here, ease and ice. The first is Middle English, uh, and the second is, is Old French. Um, both of them have a lot of different senses to them, but the, the key one uh, is this lack of effort idea, uh, characterized by, by lack of effort. There's actually also another one that Hickey found, which it, <laughs> he says it's questionable, I agree. <laughs> I couldn't really find a linkage. Uh, but it's adjacent, which is Latin, and is the root of our word adjacent. And the most salient uh, uh, definition out of that is to lie near. So this might be a little bit of a stretch, but it works really well for the talk, so I'm going to use it. The opposite of easy here is difficult. I don't really deal with difficult too much in the talk. It's really much more simple and complex and easy that I want to talk about. So easy, again, to lie near. So. There's something implicit in this very definition, right? To lie near, there, there needs to be something that it is near, basically, an agent, me. In many ways, easy is relative and subjective. It's not something which is about the thing itself. It's about my interaction with the thing. How near is the thing to me? And when we talk about easy in the, in the concept of, of actually you know, working with software, Really, a lot of what we're talking about is how near is it to my current understanding, my existing skills and knowledge, how much effort is required for me to gain understanding or, or mastery of it, or at least to be able to use it. Uh, honestly, we're pretty obsessed with, with, um, uh, with ease. As a, as a general rule, we see it all over the place. WYSIWYG is a, is a funny little example of, the, especially this nearness idea, right? Like, WYSIWYG is designed around the idea that people have a picture in their mind from using Microsoft Word for however many years. That's what editors are accustomed to. It is near to their current experience. 
And therefore, we have a whole practice and pattern of design that says, I mean, technically, you could do WYSIWYG other ways, but the conventional WYSIWYG editor is oriented towards making an experience that is near to what folks who've been working in Word documents are, are accustomed to. Um, Devel module uh, is actually it's a very different kind of example of, of nearness, but still, still useful to think about. Uh, so later on in the talk, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to mention a, a module that I wrote called Hookalizer. Um, but uh, when I was discussing it back in, in Prague last year with some folks, somebody said, oh, you should really make that a part of Devel module. And I had this like immediate knee-jerk reaction. This is before I'd seen Rich Hickey's talk, and I, I didn't quite have the words to understand why I was like revulsed by the notion of putting it inside of Devel. Um, but uh, I now understand it was, a, it was a discomfort, hello, discomfort over the idea of, uh, uh, of it being bound up with other stuff. But the reason the, the proposal was made in the first place is because putting it in Devel makes it easy for developers, easy. It is near to their sense of where they go to get tools that support them as developers. They don't have to learn a new thing. They don't have to think about a new thing. Oh, it's just packaging. It's easy. I take one action, and that's, that's fine. Package managers. Uh, you can think of this as like what you do at you know, your OS level, your Yum, your app, your whatever, or you know, for uh, uh, pulling in libraries for a... Uh, for a project that you're on, Composer, Gem, things like that. Either way, these are, these are tools which take a whole bunch of, of discrete, knowable actions and just bundle them up into something which is easy to do. And if there's a nearness to them, you could say it's near to the skill set that we have, which is bumping around in our file system on the command line and running some commands, or turning it even into UIs that you can use to run these same commands. The point is, it's proximal to what we already know and have experience with. We don't need to know how to compile something. We just need to know how to like run the script that compiles it for us. Simple. So I said already, right? Simple, simplex, one fold or braid. And it, this oneness idea is, is really important. Uh, it's, here's some examples of, of the sort of oneness that, that I'm talking about. The idea of like dealing with one content type, something having a single responsibility or role or goal. There's just one concept in play, or there's just one axis or dimension here. The key thing that is really patterned across all of these individual things here is that there's a lack of interleaving. We don't have multiple different roles or responsibilities interleaved together. When you have something that has two jobs, it's sort of split-brained. They're, they're interleaved together. It's, it's got two faces, things like that. Um, simple is not just about pure oneness, though, because there's also, if you have a constant type and you have one node of that constant type, you don't have much more complexity if you have one more node of that constant type. One instance versus five, one operation versus ten, like, if it's a known type and having more of them doesn't really make that big of a difference. That's cardinality. Simplicity is not about cardinality, for the most part. It's really about this interleaving idea. But the most important thing here is nothing that what I have just said has anything to do with any person observing a thing. Simplicity is intrinsic and objective. It is not how easy it is for me to know it or use it or whatever. It is a property that exists independent of human beings even existing at all. And this is really, really important because this is why simplicity matters when it actually comes to building large things, but ease doesn't. coming up right? Yes, good. That sort of freaked out for a second. So here is this metaphor that I really, really like. Complexity is braiding. Uh, and then a couple more words for you. Complex. This is a real word. Again, Rich Hickey found this. Uh, this is, it's like super archaic, but it is part of this whole same you know, root series of, of words. Complex means to braid together or to make complex. Uh, Decomplex is something that I like to use a lot. Uh, Hickey doesn't use it so much in his talk, but it's basically the inverse, to unbraid or to tease apart. The really useful thing, I think, about this metaphor, I mean, like, look at those braids, right? You have six steps where you go from four discrete items into one thing. You might be aware that there are four individual threads inside of this because you have some foreknowledge of it, but if you're just looking at this, you have all this stuff bound together. You can't deal with just one thread at a time. You have to deal with the entire braided, bound together construct. 
And that's the essence of what you, we should really be thinking about when we're talking about complexity. I want to focus on one thing, but I can't because it's complected with all of these other things. It's bound together. And this is contrasted with composition. Again, very literal definition, compose, to place together. Not to bind together, but to place together. Figure one here, up in the upper left, like that's stuff that's composed. It's placed next to one another. It's not bound together. They, 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 you, know, you could still use them as a group, but it's not complected together. The thing that I don't have on here, which I should sort of say is complecting, don't do it. Um, but it's, you know, <laughs> uh, again, a big difference between my talk and, and Hickey's version of this talk is I am not quite so critical of complexity maybe as, as he is. I think there's an awful lot more acceptable complexity out there, which I'll get to in a bit. So why does all this matter? I mean, you know, we sort of know intuitively that, like, clearly, you know, complexity is not great. Uh, but I want to break that down a little bit more. Like, how is it actually not great? So this is a quote from the legendary computer scientist Edsel Dijkstra. Uh, Simplicity is prerequisite for reliability. So complex systems are unreliable. Obviously, that's what he's saying. There are too many possible permutations, too many possible different behaviors, contexts in which they operate, things that they're sensitive to for us to be able to predict their behavior, for us to be able to rely on them and expect that they will behave in the way that we can we often even can't know what to expect to behave out of complex systems. It's actually funny, too, to say that because that's like inherently a human observation, right? Saying, I can't rely on it because I can't even understand all the ways that it would behave because of all the different things that it takes into consideration, all the different ways that it's bound together. I can't even picture all of its inputs. That's a little bit of a, of a subjective thing. But what that's really highlighting when you look at reliability in that sense is that the most important thing when it comes to dealing with systems and managing complexity, programming in general, is your ability to reason. If you do not have the ability to reason about the system that you are working on, you cannot change it. Reasoning is an absolute requirement to be able to do any sort of even marginally complex change, marginally worthwhile change to any system that you might be working on. If you can't reason about it, you can't work on it. The amount of time it takes you to reason for reason uh, reason about something is directly is is the direct predictor of how much time it will actually take you to solve problems inside of a system. Which is to say, that complexity is the primary limitation on our ability to reason. Now, it's uh, uh, I feel like one of the things we often do is. We have workplaces, we have colleagues. We know who of our colleagues are really, really good at dealing with hard problems, complex problems, and those who are maybe not so good. And it's really easy to get sort of stuck up in, in that and in the relative capabilities of, of people uh, and to sort of imagine that, well, you know, like that, that complexity is manageable. There's folks out there who can, who can take care of it. It's a really, really bad mentality to take because um, so imagine we have three people, right? We have uh, Robert, who is a moderately good coder, whatever, deal, dealing with, with complex problems. Um, we have uh, uh, Jamal, who is like an excellent, excellent coder, um, highly capable of dealing with complex problems. And then we have Pooja, who is the most ridiculously savant, incredible person at dealing with complexity in, in the problems that she's trying to deal with that has ever been known uh, to man. So it's like Robert, Jamal, and Pooja, somewhere up there, right? The difference between Robert and Pooja is completely insignificant in the face of the complexity that even a novice can create by using tools that are already complex, which is to say our ability to create complexity is completely unbounded. Our ability to deal with it is very, very bounded. We want to think about how to build systems that can actually be used and reused and reused and rebuilt upon, we need to keep in mind that we as humans are very limited in our ability to deal with complexity, but unlimited in our ability to create it. And in systems, when you build on top of each other, you inherit all of the complexity from the lower layers. It doesn't go away, ever. That's the other thing about simplicity, 
simplicity versus ease, right? Ease, ease goes away. Ease is a, since it's about me and whether I've learned this or not, whether I'm accustomed to it, over time, ease goes away. Simple and complex never ever go away. They're intrinsic properties of the system that we've built. So, with all this said, like, it is important to emphasize, you know, simple and easy are both important, like, and they're both difficult in, in, uh, in their own ways. Um, nobody is going to use systems that are, if, if you're pure, pure, simple systems, then great. Have fun off in the ivory tower building, you know, things that nobody can ever touch or use because they're way too iconic and perfect and whatever for anybody to actually figure them out. So yes, easy is important. Uh, it does need to happen, but the thing is, I mean, I said earlier, I think we're obsessed with ease, right? Like, you give me a script to do something. <laughs> Actually, uh, no, I think the best one is, y'all uh, seen the shirt that says, uh, uh, go away or I will replace you with a very small shell script? <laughs> right. Um, I totally need to get one of those shirts. Uh, <laughs> but um, even, like, minor optimizations in, in my ability to do my work, small scripts that I might write, things like that, are, give just, like, it's an inordinate amount of happiness that I get out of it. It's, it's honestly, it's stupid how like happy I am that I'm saving four seconds at a time and a couple of keystrokes. But I do. I love it. So, easy gets a lot of attention by default. It's sort of immediately gratifying to make something easier. Uh, simplicity, not so much. Uh, simplicity is challenging to actually chase after. It requires effort and thought in a way that just optimizing what you're doing right now can get you a long way towards easy. Simplicity is, is much harder. Both are necessary. Uh, so a crucial question, really, uh, I think that, that we need to be asking a lot of the time is, because we can go and we can learn and we should learn how to identify the complexity that we're creating, but the crucial question is once we've identified the complexity we might be creating in the systems that we're building, is it acceptable? What is it that's complected together by this system that I've built? Does it matter? I'm going to ever need to, tear, to tease those apart. Would anybody else ever need to tease them apart? So the thing about this, though, and the reason why it's worth emphasizing simplicity is because simple things usually can be made easy. Simple things often actually end up being verbose. There's a, there's a thing where somebody, somebody looks at, at, at something, and this is one of the most common ways I think that we, uh, uh, we confuse simplicity and ease. Somebody looks at, at something where there's like a bunch of individual items or there's a, there's a bunch of different sort of things, and they say, oh, this is, this is complex. No, no, no. It's not necessarily complex. If those things aren't bound together, if they represent distinct concepts, if they are all discrete ideas, by these definitions, it is not actually complex. It might be far from your understanding but it's not necessarily complex. The thing about simple things is even if they have a whole bunch of individual items that you know, people look at them and they get overwhelmed, simple systems can usually be made easy. You can put things in front of them that make interacting with them easy, that, that make easy the tasks of working with the system, whatever it might be, but the reverse does not hold. Not at all. Just because something is easy doesn't mean that there's some wonderful, simple system behind it. Easy is relative to your experience. And often what we do is we just find something which is, and this is the most dangerous pattern, we do this a lot in Drupal, we find something which is complicated, uh, or a task or some set of things which is complicated, and we're like, oh, I'll just make it easy. So you know, we build a little layer that rolls on top of this bunch of complexity, make that easy, and then, oh, somebody else comes along a little bit later and does it again, and it's this, and we just end up building these continuously more complex systems when we don't focus on simplicity first. Now, I have some very scientific graphs here, you can see, uh, they're well labeled and everything like that. Um, there, is, there is a place uh, for, for ease. Um, here uh, we have blue is, because I can't figure out D3 and I'm totally, a, again, a professional as we've been discussing uh, <laughs> here in this talk today. Easy is blue and simple is red. Um, so if you look at this totally, totally, completely, 100% accurate graph, then um, uh, you'll see there's, there is this period where at the beginning of a project, and think of time as basically the life cycle of a system, a project, whatever, as it, as it goes on, uh, over the life cycle of the software, ease becomes less and less useful. Your velocity decreases. Your ability to actually achieve changes decreases because in the background there's a whole bunch of complexity that's been, that's been built up. 
up enough for a purely easy system. Simple, on the other hand, tends to be slower at the start. And then over time, your velocity increases. Uh, you get more accustomed to it. You've built the little appropriate easy things just for, uh, uh, for what you need to uh, accomplish. And it's great. It becomes productive. Now, there, is a, there are plenty of projects for which it falls on the left side of that connection point, right? And who cares, really? Like, don't make it simple. Just spit the thing out there. But for anything where we are actually trying to build a system that will last, which we need to update, which we need to change. And the thing about Drupal is I, I like to say that Drupal is a system for uh, people who don't yet know what they need. Um, there's an awful, awful lot of changing that we do down the line as requirements evolve and expectations evolve. So we tend to have, with Drupal projects, that line tends to go on for a fair ways. Not sure how good, not sure how good an idea easy is in, in that kind of case. This is another way of looking at the same general idea, though. So here we have coolness of shit versus effort and skill. Uh, and again, simple red, easy blue. Um, so easy systems, like, they're flashy, right? You know, you get cool shit right away. That's why there are all the awesome screencasts about, nah, you know, in four lines we do uh, uh, amazing things and we build the internet. There's an amazing screencast for this thing called SQL on Rails, which is like five years old, but I always think of it whenever, whenever I think of this. Uh, they, they build a search engine in uh, just 57,000 amazing lines of SQL, and it's, it's, it's fantastic. Um, but this is the point is, you know, it's, it's flashy, uh, and it gets our attention because we like the idea of things being easy to get started with. But over time, that doesn't last. What that's really saying is actually, if you want to do increasingly cool shit, uh, you're going to have trouble if your system is really, really ease-based. It does not scale well into that. Simple things let you build really cool, complicated things. Easy things don't, by and large. Oh, there was another cute thing there. Yeah, well, I can't remember. Oh, right, yes, yes. Uh, what this is really saying is that easy systems let you rise meteorically to a level of mediocrity, and then they kind of just keep you there. You have to put more and more effort in to accomplish anything that's really worthwhile. I'm almost done with these, I promise, like general things about simple and easy, and then I'll get to something concrete. Uh, this is uh, uh, another way of, of looking at this really. Easy is about, since easy is not about understanding the system, it's just about you know, producing a result of a particular task, something like that. Easy lets replication happen very readily. I can go and I can do the easy thing, and great, I, I re-perform the task that somebody else thought through already. But if you want a generative system, something that can really make new things, you need something that is simple, which has parts, which you can recombine. It allows transformation. And then, of course, because simple can often become easy, simple will also enable replication. It just might take a little bit more work. One more quote. This is from another legendary computer scientist, Tony Hoare. There are two ways of constructing a software design. One way is to make it so simple that there are obviously no deficiencies. And the other way is to make it so complicated that there are no obvious deficiencies. <laughs> I love this quote. I love this quote. Um, and I mean, for sort of the obvious reasons, but also because it says we need to be, uh, just remember the thing, right? Like complexity is the enemy of reasoning. Complexity is the upper bound on our reasoning. What he's really saying in the second half here is that he's, he's reinforcing this idea that, like, well, I've reached my capacity to actually reason about the system, so deficiencies are not obvious. I can't just look at it and see them. I would need to go through and do a bunch of work. I would need to grind away to figure out, to dis decomplex the parts uh, in order to figure out whether or not there are any deficiencies. It also highlights that you don't really get he says, there are two ways of constructing a software design. Kind of an implied agent there. You kind of have to think about wanting to do simple in the first place. It's hard to walk back towards simple if that's not where you started. Almost to concrete. Uh, I would just wanted to quickly relate this to um, uh, some common concepts uh, that you've probably already heard and sort of re-express them in these terms. Uh, who's heard of solid object-oriented design principles? Right. So this is a set of, uh, set of principles. Um, uh, they are the single responsibility principle, the open close principle, the Liskov substitution principle, integrate or interface segregation principle, and dependency inversion. But you know, let's just talk about two. Um, interface segregation is the one that says 
you should define interfaces for the minimum possible set of methods that define like basically a single responsibility. It's very similar to the single responsibility principle. It's sort of more practical. Um, that, I mean, if you recall, on my, original, on my original simple slide, I said one responsibility is one of the key ideas that goes into actually making something simple. This is a practical application of that. This says, in order to make a simple system, in order to, to or Solid says, interface segregation, make it simple. Make the interfaces simple. Do not complex them with other responsibilities. Dependency inversion says, uh, don't rely on concretions, rely on abstractions. Don't rely on a class, rely on an interface. Allow you know, uh, uh, allow the implementation to be swapped out for something that says it does the same thing via its interface. That, um, that's a little bit of a different complexing idea, but uh, for that I kind of like the, the sort of the visual of tendrils inside of my code base. Uh, that when I rely on, when I rely on, uh, uh, when I write a class and if I, if I make it rely on, on, uh, on another class, another specific class and not an interface, I've sort of just reached out a little tendril over to that class and grabbed onto it. But by relying on an interface, I don't. There is no tendril reaching out from my code. Uh, it's the same sort of complexing, binding together thing. And of course, there's a Unix philosophy, too. Small pieces loosely coupled. I have a little thing that does just one thing, and then if I need to send it to another thing, that's fine. I pipe it together, and it's just a sort of series of things that uh, instead of being complected together uh, sort of below the hood, you just get the small parts. And you can complect them for your purposes just the one time in order to, in order to accomplish your goal. It works quite well. Now, I put dry up here. That's don't repeat yourself in code, code reuse, because I think it's actually an interesting red herring. Um, I think it's one of the problems we've seen in Drupal core. Uh, but the notion of dry, that you should reuse code as much as you can, if you don't apply that idea with care, then you'll end up reusing code. You, you'll end up refactoring that underlying code a little bit, and suddenly its responsibility is going to start to drift. If you are not really rigorous about what this code does, then you'd be like, oh, I don't want to write another thing. I'll just tweak this a little bit. Now all of a sudden this thing has two faces, and then four, and then 12, and then whatever. Uh, be careful with dry. It's way better. Because again, as I, as I said before, like simple, sometimes quite verbose. Just because you have a lot of code that is maybe a little bit different, if they are serving really different responsibilities, if it is simpler, if it is uncomplected to keep them separate and have a little bit of code repeating, do it. Much better decision. Here I have our little tenderly thing. So all right, we're going to get a little bit more con concrete now, finally. And this is where I like really diverge from, from Hickey. Uh, like I said, he makes the whole argument is, is uh, <laughs> simplicity in the inputs. and. Uh, well, I'll, 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 I'll thank Sam Richard for this. Um, he's, not, he's not incorrect. Like, inside of this very useful way of looking at complexity, yeah, if you have simpler inputs, then you're going to have a system that's going to scale you know, much better into, uh, uh, into the sorts of complex projects you might want to do. And like, he, th he hates things like variables. We couldn't really have a useful conversation about that, but they're mutable state. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, so instead, you know, I'm going to focus on things that are a little bit more practical and useful for Drupal. challenge with that, though, of course, is that Drupal is already so complected together <laughs> in so many different ways that, hey, surprise, surprise, in a talk about complexity, it's hard to find an example of complexity that's not so complex that you can't put it on a screen and talk about it usefully. It's, yeah, uh, it's sort of a catch-22 there. But I have a couple. Um, I would also love folks afterwards, like I would like to continue giving this talk and I would like to improve it quite a bit. Uh, so if folks have examples of like things that are stuck together, and you know this when you go in and you know, I, I want to just work on this thing. And then you find yourself, well, I can't do that because I have to do this because they're stuck together. And then I can't do that because I have to do this because they're stuck together. The expression for that, by the way, is shaving the yak. You go and, and in order to do the thing that I want to do, I have to shave this yak first. Well, right. Uh, that's when things are complected together. So right, if y'all have examples of things in Drupal that you run across that are complected together, please give them to me. And perhaps I'll add them to this. Already too long talk. So off you go. I want to sort of start off with an easy one. I'm going to talk about global variables. We all know the global variables are bad. Yes, yes, nod your heads. Yes, good, excellent. Global variables are bad. Right, excellent. good. Full agreement. Um, global variables complect your code with all other code in your PHP process. Uh, 
Mark Sonnenbaum gave me a, a quote from, he didn't remember where yesterday about this, which is to say that basically every global variable that you have is an implicit argument to every function in your entire code base. So, you know, if you wouldn't write functions with 10 or 15 or 20 arguments that you don't ever use, why would you use global variables? I totally should have done a little visual, visual of that, of like parameter list just going off the right side of the screen because, yeah, that's what a global variable is. It's available to every function. It's essentially an argument to every function. Interestingly, though, um, even though they are a complector, they are definitely a complector. They bind all your code together. They're actually, I think in practice, they end up being a little bit less risky because the failures kind of tend to be obvious. Like when somebody messes with uh, when somebody messes with a global variable, the things that are dependent on it tend to sort of uh, uh, tend to tend to fail quickly and, and, and obviously. So we notice them fast, which means they're sort of not as not as risky overall. Uh, they're really really wicked easy to use, I think, which is obviously why we we end up using them. Uh, and in a very small application where there's not even that much difference between the global scope and like your local scopes, it's not that big of a deal. But of course, they're hell for testing. You can't really swap them out. Um, PHP's deficiencies being what they are, you can't like easily spawn up other processes or control them or manage them. You can't mock them out or anything like that. They're just global. They're there in PHP, so can't really work with them. The real issue with them, though, like I said, I was going to talk about state. Um, they are a more general problem of state, and truthfully, a lot of Drupal's problems actually come down to problems of state. Uh, if you don't like thinking about state, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't really like thinking about it easier because it hurts because state is terrible and state complexes everything. State, in general, variables, they complex value with time. And what that means is you have a variable, it has some value, and at any point during serving a Drupal request, that value can change. When there is only one possible value that can be there, you're uncomplected with time. It doesn't matter what time it is, it's always just that one value. But if it's a variable, if it can change, if it does change, then it means there's a whole bunch of different states that that variable can be in over the course of the request. And if your code checks it at one time, then maybe it's this value, and if it checks it at a different time, maybe it's this other value. Does it expect that it changed? Maybe, maybe, maybe it should change over time, which means now you have to write an if statement inside of your code to see, well, if it's this kind of thing, then I do this, and if it's that kind of thing, then I do that. And then maybe there's a third state, maybe a fourth or fifth, and your stuff just starts getting longer, and everybody else starts, yeah. This is what state complex with time means. When it has multiple different states that it can be in, you incur more responsibility. You have to handle every one of those states for your code to really be correct and safe. It weaves into everything that touches it. Everything that touches state and any, anything that can be mutated has to, to be fully correct, which is often more than we really need to, uh, uh, to aspire to. Um, uh, it needs to handle all the different possible states that things can be in. Uh, I don't have a slide for this, but I'll quickly say uh, uh, one of the things I was considering putting in is if you have setters on classes, uh, the expectation being that the class gets created um, and then you'll pass in some additional value, setter injection. Uh, I'm going to pass in some additional value. You're mutating that object's state. And if it's a really important thing that that like, object needs in order, to do its, in order to do its primary work, then that object actually has at least two states in which it's in. It has, I've been created, and I'm actually ready to do my work. And if the responsibility for doing that, for working with that is external, then now your code has, you've incurred additional responsibility in your external code. I have to have the thing and then set the thing at a separate time. And inside of the class, you have to, as soon as you introduce the possibility, the, the possibility at all that there could be a state in which it doesn't have like a required service that it needs to do its work. You have to wrap everything in if statements. Do I have my service injected? Is it here? Is it there? If you add two of those or three of those, you just poof, everything explodes. State cannot be mitigated by modularization. You can't interface away or design away these sorts of state problems. This is part of the reason that they're so tricky. So I heard this thing. Um, and I hear this, and I hear this a lot. And you know, you think about this, this with, with global variables, right? Because, in fact, actually, I, I wager that some of you may have sort of even thought this about global variables. He's being ridiculous. Like, who's going to go in and change a global variable? Yeah. Stop saying this. Stop it. Uh, I heard this a couple times yesterday. Maybe want to tear my hair out. I say it to be clear. I'm not really saying like you're all bad and I'm good. No, no, no. Like, we say this way too much. As long as no one does something stupid, it'll all be all right. Nobody will touch that global. It'll be fine. Yeah, you know. Um, 
Yeah, that's not a strategy for software design, if you didn't know that already. Um, I mean, obviously at a certain level, like you can't, you can't prevent people from doing something really stupid, but we need to, like, we need to walk back the level uh, of the stupidity that we're talking about. Like, I would really like this to be, well, it works as long as, um, as long as the person tries to run it on a computer and not a plate of spaghetti. Like, that's, that's a much more appropriate level to be having this discussion than, oh, it works as long as you implement these three separate hooks in these different places and toggle these configuration values correctly that I haven't really documented. Like, oh, all right, thanks, that's, that's awesome. Um, we, need to be, we need to be aiming for plate of spaghetti much more than undocumented array configuration options. This is also to say, and I think this, this gets you right, like just the first part of this is important too, and I haven't sliced it off, but like it works, right? Stepping back for a moment, this whole talk is not about whether or not something works. Not the topic here. You can make something work, whether it's simple or easy. This is about the cost of complexity, and the dangerous thing with it works is, I mean, yeah, we'll keep on pounding along in the direction that we've been doing where things just get more and more complicated and we don't ever really pay down the debt and it just gets worse and worse and worse. So be careful if it works and definitely be careful if it works as long as no one does something stupid. It's a good sign that you should be tightening up your API some more. All right, config entities, harder now. Um, there's a lot here. Uh, but config entities complex together the notions of config and entities and plugins. And if y'all are not familiar with these, this is Drupal 8 config entities, so I'm going to give you some sort of quick definitions, right? Entity, Drupal's fundamental data building block. It's the basis for attaching fields, for typing and, and instancing of data. Config, key value pairs or sets of key value pairs representing configuration that can be moved between Drupal instances via a known procedure. And plugin. A uh, collection of logic, typically represented as a class, that solves a particular well-defined logical problem. These three concepts, config entities, bundle them all together. Now, it's not necessarily all bad that they're all complected together. And this is actually an interesting case because this is one where when config entities were originally created two years ago, something like that, um, they were a lot worse. We've done an awful lot to actually decomplex them uh, by, by narrowing out a lot of the interfaces and, and granularizing, uh, granularizing some things. But for starters, we have these complected interfaces here. So we have our config entity base, our base class, uh, which extends entity, basic entity, and it implements config entity interface. All right, so then there's also config entity interface, which extends entity interface. This is the, the complexing at the interface level that says, um, uh, config are types of, config entities are, are types of, of entities. Now, to be clear, sorry, the reason that we went with config entities is basically we needed to be able to create instanced configuration, not just what is like, you know, the, I don't know, the base URL for the entire site, but hey, I've got, you know, a bunch of different views and I want to be able to, I need instance config for each of them. They need their own little bits of config. Uh, so we said, hey, entities have instances and a couple of other nice methods. Let's pull them in. Ignoring the large segments of the interface that were not actually relevant to the problem space of config. The other piece of this then, uh, and, and this is actually not config entities at all, this is entities and plugins were complected long before config got complected with entities and then we just had a giant incestuous nightmare. Um, but uh, entity manager, is a type of plugin manager. We use the plugin system in order to discover and locate, uh, uh, in order to discover and locate uh, uh, entity types, and that's its own little bit of fun too. Because the plugin system has like the notion of discovery and hmm and hmm that I can't remember. Discovery and factory and something else. What else? There you go. Yeah, mappers, great. Um, so, uh, but it has a couple discrete ideas in it. Um, and we wanted discovery, so we took all of them because they're complected together. Uh, and, and you don't have a choice, the whole thing, gotta take the whole thing. But the problem that I really have nowadays, uh, it used to be a lot worse uh, with, with, uh, with config and entities. Oh man, I'm at 545, all right. I gotta zoom in along a little bit. Um, Problem that I really had with, with config and entities was they're, they're not content. Like, there's a whole bunch of methods related to being content that were on the original entity interface. 
A lot of those, definitely not all, but a lot of them have been moved down to, uh, to a content interface, which is what I said, we've, we've decomplected those things. We've made a sort of more basic concept of an entity. Uh, but there are still these two kinky little methods on here, uh, bundle and URL that are on entity interface, which means that all config entities have to implement those, those, um, those methods. A bundle is for fields. Uh, it's declaring the, the uh, field attachment point. It's irrelevant for config. Uh, <laughs> one could make the argument, of course, that, well, it might be convenient to put, config, to put fields on config at some point, and my response would be, no, get out. Um, like, this is why we define separate responsibilities. I don't care if it's convenient. Like, it violates the domain. It's not simple. It binds crap together. Don't do it. Find another way of combining other simple tools or more broken down pieces to achieve that goal. But just because this system solves 30% of your problem doesn't mean it's okay to ignore the 70% that is irrelevant to what you're actually trying to do. URL uh, is also in its own way interesting. Uh, I don't necessarily buy that config should have a, well, it says there is exactly one URL for which, uh, exactly one URL at which you configure this bit of, uh, this, this, this bit of config. I don't buy that. Um, that doesn't make sense to me. That config should only ever have one place that it's configured. Like, it, it means that I, by giving it a URL, it forces me to have each and every bit of config be its own atomic thing. I can't recombine them necessarily. I can't. Uh, build a system underneath whereby, well, you just use this config entity as sort of a storage bit for a broader set of config things that, you know, can work in different places, which is actually a system that I've tried to build. Uh, so there's that. It also doesn't allow for the possibility that, no, I actually don't want you to provide any UI at all. Why should there have to be a URL? And, of course, the response there is, well, it still works if, you know, you don't implement the methods. But like I said, it works is not a software design principle. Not a software design principle. It doesn't belong there. If it adds the method, if to have the method there sends the signal, I do this, I can do this. And just because it doesn't do it doesn't mean that it's okay that you have the signal out there in the first place. Not at all. All right. Complected layers. Also, this is a different problem with, with config entities. So config is its own discrete system. And as it was originally designed, it sort of sits you know, down at the bottom and does its config thing. And it doesn't really reach into or need to touch any other, uh, uh, any other systems. And in good software design, we build in layers. That's how it works. So config could be down here at the bottom. And then ideally, we would have built config entities on top. The problem is, at import time, import is what happens when you have, when you are importing config. You uh, put some new config in place, and you want to import it into your system so it's actively used by your new Drupal site. Uh, that is one place where we complex the layers, where we bust between the layers. The config system, which should be able to sit down here and pay no attention whatsoever to the layer on top, which is the config entity system. Config is a simpler, more basic system with a more narrow set of requirements. At import time, it has to call the entity system and say, well, I've got a bunch of entities, and you go off and you process your thing. You've complected the layers together. They're no longer isolated. Config is now conscious of the layer above it. It's less reusable. It's dangerous. Increases risk. So, all right. This is how you know that I'm serious, is I'm going after the thing that actually got me recognition in Drupal in the first place, panels. How many use panels? How many hate panels? That was actually a fairly, fairly e easy inversion there, like we had, you know, yeah. All right, so panels. It complex your information architecture with presentation incorrectly. It's wrong. Um, by that I mean, uh, well, so okay, one of the things that, that um, panels is basic internals say, I have a display object, right? And whenever you go and you do your drag and drop y create thing with panels, whether it's in like page manager or panelizer or anything like that, you're creating a display object. It's got a bunch of panes in it, that's how it works. Um, thing is that it's a, it's a very nice, uh, uh, it's very sort of nice, very isolated sort of share nothing approach to things, but that doesn't actually model the way that um, uh, it doesn't model the way that websites really work correctly. Like, you have elements that you want to share across discrete systems. So Panels' response to this is, we're just going to figure out basically everything at, like, an outer routing layer and then have a share-nothing approach once we get to the elements of display. The proper approach is, you know what, there's shared stuff that appears in multiple different places. 
and uh, I want to deal with some things at, at the level of picking which panel I use, and then some other things at the level of here's a shared bit that exists between a bunch of different panels. So if anybody has ever had the situation where you have like, you know, 20 different panels configured inside a page manager with variants that are just like differentiating on one teensy little condition, and you have one little thing that varies between the panels, and now all of a sudden you're in maintainer hell and click itis craziness because to update, you know, the full set uh, with one little change, you have to do it 20 times over, and then you, you know, slit your own wrists. Yeah, that's because the model's wrong. That's because it complex the wrong things together. Now, interestingly, panels internally is actually more composed than it is complected. Uh, it is things placed together. It has a bunch of discrete individual plugin bits, uh, which each have a discrete responsibility, and they do their own thing, and there's a bunch of layers to it. And it's actually it's pretty good about, about keeping those things separate. Problem is it's an array-oriented API, so it's only sort of a pseudo API. Uh, and there's enough pieces to it that it's really just sort of overwhelming, and we don't document it very well, too. Uh, so that is to say it's sort of really never been made easy. But when it comes to the interface, which is a lot of what really just you know, blows people up about it, reasonably so, um, it commits this, this interface sin, which is one of the other things to be careful of. Great, you've, you're totally convinced by my talk. You want to go off and build simple systems. Now you go and you build a simple system in Drupal, which means you, you know, drive all the configuration to the interface. Oh, yeah. Well, the panel's cockpit is because it commits the sin of, instead of building an interface that imparts knowledge about how the system works, it builds an interface which requires knowledge about how the system works. There's a bunch of implicit context that goes into how Panels is operating and what it's changing and what things it's, it's working with, which isn't really expressed. It just sort of expects you to know. And the options that you're given only make sense if you already have that knowledge. That is really the internals, and this is why I have this last line, is the internals are complected with configuration UIs, but only partially so. It's like, I'll just pop up configuration options, but I won't truly really explain like the context into which they fit, which then goes back to, well, you only actually have part of the picture, which makes it very, very difficult to learn and reason about the system. These are my ultimate nemesis, alter hooks. Uh, oh, God, I hate these so much. Um, <sighs> complex logic through shared state. We already talked about state. But, you know, alters are just <laughs> a slightly better version of a global variable, something like that. You know, yeah, let's pass this around, and everybody can change it. Traditionally, these have been an escape hatch, uh, but in practice, it kind of amounts to runtime configuration. I'm going to change this array, and then another system where the, all, all the logic actually lives is going to behave differently. It's a very weird kind of declarative-oriented programming thing inside of a, an imperative program. Uh, I also, oh, I had something that I used to say about this. It's like Drupal's, um, Drupal's like a, a shitty version of of Lisp without any of the proper primitives. Lisp, where you can manipulate the structure of the program, you, you basically work by, uh, by changing the structure of the program from the program. It's this very sort of meta thing. Well, Drupal's like that, except it's arrays, so it's terrible, because you have none of the actual tools that you need to be able to work effectively in a system like that. Alter hooks wreak havoc on artifact stability. Oh, I didn't talk about construct versus artifact. Well, easy is what you use, right? It's the thing that you interact with goes away. The artifact is what you build. It is the software that runs. Alter hooks make the permutation space of the different ways that the artifact can be just explode like crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. And because there are all these different states that it can be in, you can't necessarily reason about how the thing's going to behave. It'll probably be this way, except for this line of code that all of a sudden was activated because it was the seventh Tuesday of some made up month and you're in Tanzania or something like that. You don't know. Like, again, these things might seem like remote possibilities, but the risk is introduced because they are possibilities, not because somebody actually did them. All right, so solutions, quickly. Two basic ideas. One is to decomplex and the other is to simplify. So I, I'm drawing lines between these because I, I think it's, one could really make an argument that, that they mean the same thing, uh, but I like the idea of having the two separate ones so that we can actually talk about doing two separate types of work. Decomplecting, for me, you're teasing apart these complex artifacts. You're not actually like changing the code, but again, you know, the complecting thing. I make a braid and I have to deal with the whole thing and I didn't even really know what the inputs to it were. So decomplecting is the action of taking that artifact, that braid, and teasing out the individual parts and showing what the individual parts are. 
It's crucial information, which again, if our goal is to be able to reason about a system, then having that information brought to us by something that decomplexes a complex artifact is massively useful, massively useful. It amplifies our ability to reason about a system. Simplifying, on the other hand, is basically making new, simpler artifacts. Say, nope, I'm not, I'm not going to work with that. I'm going like, to turn that whole thing off, or I'm going to swap it out for something else, which is just intrinsically simpler. So I have two things uh, that are both decomplectors. Uh, I mentioned before I have this hookalizer project. I wrote this last year. This is actually, like, it's really cool. Um, obviously, I mean, you know, obviously I'm going to say that, but uh, what hookalizer does is it takes over the module handler, which is the thing that actually, like, all Drupal alters run through, and it inspects data as it goes through the altar. So whenever you call an altar, if you have Hookalizer installed, it's taken over the module handler, and it snapshots the state of the data before, every, before and after every single implementation of the altar. And it provides diffs. So you can actually see which implementation is making changes to exactly which parts of the altar structure. It is actually like maybe the most literal definition of decomplecting that I can think. Ordinarily with alters, has anybody ever actually tried to like go through and debug which alter a change is coming from? Yeah, it's a nightmare, right? Like, y there, there just aren't tools for that. You, it doesn't matter if you're in your debugger, like, great, you know, you have your debugger, I'm going to just dump out a 14 depth array and then put that in a text file and then the next iteration through I'll do it again and then I'll like run a diff between the two files. That's kind of the most effective means that I've been able to come up with for, for something like that. It's terrible. Uh, so what Hokalizer does, like I said, it, it actually just does that for you, and then it dumps the output to, uh, to the UI. Um, this was super fun. Uh, turns out that in Drupal 8 core, we have recursive structures which print R can't handle. I blew four gigs of memory trying to print R certain structures that, uh, that we passed through Drupal Alter. And so the fun part was I wrote an engine in, in PHP which actually does the snapshotting and the diffing. And somehow, I'm still not sure why PrintR can't handle them, but um, captures those correctly. Uh, so it tells you, here's where the changes are. Um, uh, this, I would love help on this. Uh, I being, as we demonstrated early, terrible with HTML and like all real computer things. Uh, it needs help actually building the visual front end for it. Like, I've built the engine, I need to take the output data and, you know, print it out nicely to the page. Love help on that. Collaboration testing. This is a, a much more nascent idea, um, but again, it's focused on the hook system. Um, so, you know, right now, whenever you write a simple test, you say, here are the modules that I want you to have enabled. And as soon as you write that line, you have rendered that test absolutely fucking useless for any real site because, hey, those aren't the modules that I have enabled. And since we have a wonderfully complected system, it means that you're not actually testing the real system that you have in production. So that, of course, then also means that if you're going to write simple tests for your, for your production system and you have, you know, a set of modules enabled, then it's, it's gross. Uh, they're very brittle. Um, so the idea behind collaboration testing is, hey, let's, like, let's look at the point of complexity. Let's look at the point of entanglement, where the collaboration occurs, when mostly, for the most part, hooks or events are fired, and different actors come into the system unaware that they're there, different modules come into the system unaware that the others are there and start doing things, and give them an opportunity inside of this, this collaboration testing framework to, basically, we set up a, like, a collaboration test that captures something like, you know, uh, uh, what was the one I was doing? Um, Hook form alter or something? Uh, yeah. A discrete event uh, th that occurs that multiple actors might be participating on. It gives them the opportunity to first, it, you know, runs the event uh, in, in, a, in a mocked up way, and then it gives all the actors the opportunity to say, is the system correct at the end of this event? Now, it's hard to get something which is like pure red green pass fail out of this sort of a system, but the thing that's powerful about this is like, if we could actually make this work, uh, we could, first of all, we would be documenting in a much more proper way like what our modules expect the state of the system to be in a very practical way. Not in, you know, read me somewhere, but in something that you can make a computer go do for you. Uh, but also, it would allow for us to write tests in contrib which actually deliver value to real running sites. You write a, you participate in a collaboration test, you, you write some collaboration tests, uh, as part of a contrib module, and then when it's actually you know, put down into someone's site, everybody else who's participating in that same collaboration test, they all get run collectively. That's the whole point. 
Collaboration test involves all the modules that you currently have working on a particular collaboration point. Everybody gets to check and verify and see if the state of the system is correct at the end of that. Could be pretty great. We would actually get reusability out of our tests for the first time in ever. So, yeah. The other option, simplification. Almost done. Um, this is harder. Uh, and honestly, it's way easier to do in, in core than contrib, of course. Although with the advent of the ability to basically change anything you want thanks to Symphony and its services, uh, <laughs> you, can, you can pull out a lot of stuff um, in, in eight. Uh, but I don't have any like specific pointers that I can send people towards. Uh, the other pointer on the decomplecting front is I think it would be interesting for somebody to write not, not a – there's two types of complexity that are typically talked about. There's NPATH complexity and cyclomatic complexity. I don't want to – get into what those are exactly, but I think it would be interesting for someone to write a complexity path analyzer that is specifically oriented towards determining the number of, of paths, uh, uh, determining the number of paths based on, like, again, the currently enabled set of modules. I'm very focused on the hook system because that's Drupal's basic interaction mechanism. It's where a lot of our complexity comes from in practice. So for simplification, uh, it's way easier to do in core than contrib. If you're going to do it, uh, then, well, if you're going to build a new system, try to really only build on components that you understand. Try to build on components where you understand how they work, not how to use them. How to use them is about easy. How they work is about simple. Simple is how you know whether or not it's something you should build on or not. Because remember, if you build on it, you take all of its complexity and make it your own. In general, focus on swapping over altering. We are so obsessed with the alter pattern because, hey, I just write one line. It makes, works the way that I want it to. Uh, that we forget that it's a perfectly valid way, it's perfectly valid to use, instead of changing the way that this thing works, I'm instead going to just put in my own version of how it works. It's a much more explicit way of operating. It's much clearer to everybody else in the system. All right, quick recap. Simple and easy, very different, both important. Simplicity can enable easy, but not vice versa. Easy has nothing to do with making with whether or not something's simple. Simple is generative. Easy is a dead end. You get what you designed for and really not a lot more. Uh, Drupal desperately, desperately needs more simple systems and simplicity-oriented people. So to that end, I have this little thought, right? Like, I guess you can't read this. Folks seen the Drupal learning curve before? Yeah? So this is this thing. Uh, Dries published this original one a long, long time ago. It must have been at least five years ago. Um, there have since been some sort of other versions of it done, but up at the top there, uh, up at the top actually says, I'm a chicks or, or unconed. Um, probably a very small percentage of people even know who unconed is at this point. Uh, but uh, uh, I think actually, the way that I look at this, it's a little bit better to say at the very, very top, the most important thing that you can do once you've mastered all the other skills, once you've figured out all the other things, once you actually understand some piece of how Drupal works, the highest calling in Drupal is reducing complexity, decomplexing, simplifying, whichever one it is. That is your job. If you are adding features to Drupal when you have enough understanding of how the system works to be able to make it simpler, you're not helping. Drupal can make features all day long. Make it simpler. That is what is slow. That's why we have these long, long release cycles, because we can't solve problems effectively because we've made such a giant, complected mess. Figure out a part of it. Figure out how to make that part of the system simpler. Defend it. Stake your territory out. I mean, you know, I sort of think of it almost like build a little castle and just make sure that everybody only comes in through the front door. Everybody running every which way to everybody else's thing is part of the problem. So... Pick out your spot, find that, become a simplifier. It is the best thing you can do for the project in the long run. I'm hoping that maybe this talk will help promote the idea that that's a type of person that we should value and hoist up. That's it. <laughs> Questions? Mike is in the middle. Thank you for staying long. I realize this is wrong. Um, you referenced uh, Rich Hickey at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, but you sort of passed on the idea of functional programming as a solution. What about immutable data? It would seem I, to go a long way. I love immutable data, and I actually love functional programming. Um, I didn't mean to pass on the idea of it as a reasonable solution, but it's not going to help Drupal. 
I mean, like the the discussions that you have around persistent data structures and controlling things like that. Well, I mean, actually, you know, I'll say a little thing here. Can I do this effectively? Let's see. No. So I have a little library. Is that Prozone? Is that what's up there? Yeah, I got drunk one night and probably did copyright infringement. Um, but uh, so I wrote this little library, which is it's super small. It's a little composer library, which basically just lets you manage object state. You can freeze objects and you can lock and unlock them. Um, there are things, there are small steps that we could take towards actually like achieving immutability. But frankly, it's not like it's not a language feature that there's really much support for. And PHP is not fast enough to write like. PHP is not fast enough to put our base data structures, of which there are so many. <laughs> My gut tells me PHP is not fast enough to put those inside of the sorts of abstractions that we would need in order to do a persistent data structure, different from immutable, um, uh, which is where we would get a lot of the sort of value that, that they talk about. Persistent data structures are wicked cool, but it's, it's just not really feasible, I think, in our, in our environment. Other questions? Hi, uh, I enjoyed your talk. I like the, I especially like the um, the sort of philosophical thinking about easy and simple, which I haven't done in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you think maybe there is um, an inherent complexity to something like Drupal, where it's kind of trying to be all things to all people, right? Like you said, you don't, people don't necessarily know that they're what they're going to do with it. So mm -hmm. if that is uh, in a way maybe a pessimistically speaking, an impossible obstacle to simplifying it. And also, um, sort of a two-parter, if yep. the sort of, if there's an acceleration to the complexity, like you said, it's really hard to walk backwards towards simple. So as more and more people collaborate, as it gets bigger and bigger, complexity is just spreading out like a glass of water you toss on the floor or something. What, Urban what do you think about something like that? Yeah. yeah. What do you think about those? Um, what was the first one again real quick? Just um, inherently complex. Right. Uh, so I think it's actually funny because as I've started thinking more and more in this kind of direction, like uh, I think actually w it should be the opposite, right? Like if you want to be all things to all people, you have a much stronger requirement to be simple. It's kind of the thing. Like, you know, easy doesn't recombine. Simple does. So if you want to be that thing, you should have a you should really, you need to reach a much, much higher standard in terms of achieving simplicity. So I don't know that it's like I think a lot of the issue actually has to do with layering. Oh, there was a there was a thought I wanted to put in there, but I think individually folks need to decide uh, at any given time, with any code that you're writing, it needs to be one or the other. Make it simple or make it easy. But if you are building something which you expect to be reused and recombined, fuck easy. Stop it. No, like seriously, just don't don't do that. Like take your time, make it simple. Find someone else who wants to use it and have them work on the easy part of it. Honestly, simple and easy, it's kind of hard to hold both in your head at the same time. And given external stimulus, it's really easy to fall off in the easy direction. So I don't know. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think it's inevitable that it has to be complex. Certainly it is with where we are right now. The only other thing I can say there is it's, it's interesting to note how most of the systems that we have in Drupal, that we have had in Drupal, uh, that continue to exist in eight, I would say are not substantially less complex. Uh, they are at least as if not more complex by these definitions than, um, uh, than they were before. But some of the new systems we've built, like config, uh, are relatively isolated. I have my assets patch, which if ever gets done, is just like there's like a, there's a little tiny entranceway through which stuff comes. And then there's this big old domain that works in a very, very specific, <coughs> tightly bound way. It's its own discrete subsystem, like I said. I built a castle, and I let people in the front door, and you are not getting in any other way. Um, so I don't know. There's steps we can take, but it's, it's going to be hard. Like, don't reuse stuff. <laughs> Maybe that's the best thing to do. If you, want, if you want to have a data object, you know, just like make some simple value objects. Don't use the entity system. Maybe I should say that. Sure. So yeah. did you think, I'm not sure if I got this part of the answer, but you think there's accelerating complexity? Like, are we, or maybe another way of saying it is, are we going in the wrong direction that we can't get yeah, back probably. from? Yeah, <laughs> probably. Um, I'm frankly, yeah, probably. Um, there's, I, I think there's just such, especially now, it's it's very difficult to get patches in, um, and 
I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm not sh here. I won't say accelerating. What I will say is that I think we have really the wrong values when it comes to evaluating the utility that a that a patch brings to the system, and the wrong expectations around how we should be looking at patches, uh, at, at at changes that we make. So that probably enables the possibility of acceleration. I don't feel like I have enough information to say accelerating, but I feel like I have enough information to say that. Thanks. Yep. So at some point, we want to create unpredictable systems, things where we can't just look at them and say, well, anything a user does, I can predict what will happen. So does that mean that we have to have complexity somewhere? Or if we have sufficiently many layers, each one of which is, is isolated and, and understandable, um, is, is that enough? My, I mean, my general thinking is, like, no, we can never anticipate all the things that the users will do. Uh, but it, it's really about, like, simple system says, here are some basic concepts. We don't string them together. You know, we, we let you string them together. It's simplicity in the inputs and complexity in the patterns. So uh, I, the, the sort of holy grailish thing that I, that I think about is you, you build a simple first. Uh, you have sort of atomic interfaces if you must build UIs for them. Um, and then you focus on, all right, I have this use case and this use case and this use case, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stitch together a UI that solves this one and then solves that one and then solves that one. Um, but the most risky thing that we have is, is basically like we, we have interfaces which complect together uh, wanting to like allow people to, cr to recombine bunches of different parts, but also like you know, very linear wizarding configuration types of things. Those are very different types of tasks. I have multiple discrete parts of the system that I'm trying to configure to make interact all nicely, and then I have a linear wizard to solve a single problem. Like, I would prefer a little bit less of the former, I think, uh, and a little bit more of the latter, and drive the responsibility for doing the former further down into code, into things which you actually have to touch code in order to do, for better or worse. Yeah. Thanks. So I wanted to ask you um, if you have a better answer to uh, horizontal extensibility than the alters that you've been railing against for oh so long, yeah. right? So I think one of the things that gives Drupal a lot of power is that you don't take a basic node form and say, now I'm going to take that node form and I'm going to extend that node form class, right, in an imaginary other version of Drupal, and tack on a sign-on sheet, right? Mm -hmm. A sign-in sheet for an event, let's say. Or take it and, uh, and extend it sort of in a traditional OO way and say, now I'm going to add a product add to cart button. Um, back to that sort of combinatorial thing that you were talking about, mm -hmm. we give you the ability to say you can do both because it's a hook form alter, so both can reach in, muck with that data structure in ways that none of the other modules expected, and one module can take the node form and add a sign on, like a, a sign up. Another one can add the add to cart, mm -hmm. and yet still another one can make those two pieces interact so that you can't do one without the other. Yep. Um, I think that's a lot of what's given Drupal its legs over the last ten years, um, and uh, I think it's a piece that has made it almost impossible for us to do meaningful combinatorial testing, because. Um, while you can say, yeah, I can make sure that I still have my thing on the sheet and it can be filled out, it's much harder to say, um, oh, and I understand that I now shouldn't be able to do that because some other module is tying me to something else and there's, there's other things that I wasn't aware of that now are required for me to work properly. Well, that's actually the purpose of the collaboration testing. Like, it's perfectly fine that people should write in those expectations. This is how I expect it to work. And if some other module alters it, like that's useful information. It's then do not, you need this to? Is, this is why I said that they're not necessarily something which are really, really amenable to simple red green pass. Like the information that comes back that says this module has had its expectation violated isn't necessarily a reason that you don't deploy. But it's something that you, who want to be able to reason about your system, should want to know. Interesting. And do you have any better solutions to the horizontal the... thing? Uh, yeah, you know, we've talked about this before uh, quite a bit, and uh, so I've been writing a new graph library, 
And I'm really annoyed because in the basic, uh, the basic set of axes that I've set up, I have one four-dimensional axis, one, uh, one, one four-element axis, one three-element axis, uh, two two-element axes. So that's two times two times three times four. Yeah, 48 possibilities, 48 possible permutations of ways that I you know, have to implement a graph. Um, it's annoying. It sucks. Sometimes simple is more verbose. Suck it up. Now, I hear what you're saying. Like, wait, wait. So you're telling me that um, the answer to horizontal scalability is just to think about configuration in an n-dimensional space. Yes, that's clear. And that's going to make it all much more simple. No. Um, uh, what I'm saying is that there are times when it's not a clear-cut answer either way. Um, there are times when saying, no, these really are like separate things, and I'm going to do them separately, and I'm going to force that they are separate. And this is what I was saying about like dry. Not always the best thing to follow, just dry. Number of lines of code you have to write in order to accomplish something, not the best measure of whether it's doing healthy things to your system or not. So yes, there is enormous convenience that comes out of these alters. There's no question about that. Um, I don't have a clear place to draw the line. Uh, and, and I also wouldn't really dispute your basic point that that's probably where a lot of Drupal's utility has come in, or Drupal's adoption has come in from. Is you have this one thing that you can do, which might have really nasty effects in terms of how it complex the system, but it solves your one problem real good, and it works. So uh, I don't know where the line is. Um, where the appropriate point to draw it and say, you know what, we're going we're gonna to factor this into an n-dimensional problem space uh, and let there be some code reuse and not allow altering uh, and force people to swap, or say, yeah, it's still fine to stick with the alters. I don't have a clear, like, it's case-by-case -case basis. Um, what I do know, the, the only thing I feel I can clear, clearly say about it is that we are so, so stuck to the idea of it has to be easy that we can't make decisions that push us even a little bit in the simple direction because, oh, well, if I don't have one alter for that, then nobody's going to use that, and, rah, 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 and to which I say, suck it up. And it does feel like we're starting to suffocate under the yes. interdependencies and interconnectedness that makes it impossible to do testing or anything else. Right, which is, which is the point. It's that you, know, you don't necessarily have to take this approach right from the beginning when you build something, but we're now suffocating. That's the cost of the complexity that we built by reusing these sorts of patterns. So, yeah. Just to continue that discussion for just a second, like, Form alter, like, we probably won't be able to get away from that anytime soon yeah. because of the utilities talking about. Mm -hmm. But, like, altering the module list during runtime, like, we can do yeah. that. There's a hook Dying for that. fire, right. Like, it's, why? Oh. That doesn't really make sense. Okay. And also, hook module implements alter. That's a great one, too. Yeah, so things like that, those are valid complexity that we might actually look at, and we can define a better way of doing it in the space to solve it in. Um, I, I waited until there weren't any more questions. We're good. Okay, I got I, I have to ask. You, you said that uh, you know mentioned that plugins and their interfaces. Would you not say that the plugin interfaces are simple? Kind of a troll since you did sign off on them. I did. It's true. I did. Um, uh, well, here's the thing. It's all a question of degree, right? And what's acceptable complexity? Uh, I don't think one. I, we name different parts of them. There are three interfaces which comprise the plugin manager interface. Clearly, that's three different things complected together. Maybe that's acceptable complexity. That's why I had that slide in there. The question, the operant question is, what is acceptable complexity? Um, those were three things which uh, uh, I think. I think actually the the interesting thing about the config and the entity discussion with with plugins is entity entities wanted discovery. And they got plugins. Could we have done it where discovery was its own thing, and that's what they got, and they didn't have to get the rest of it? Maybe. It, it is its own interface. Right, it is its own interface, but they ended up using the whole thing. Could that, we have done it differently? They, they did that. And I'll, I'll say it why. This actually was um, something you hinted on. Um, it's because they wanted the, comp the, the complexity that was embedded in the base class. The, in the in the in the, the manager base class. in the oh, manager the class. base class, right? They wanted so, the factory like ish behavior, uh, right? And, and things like things. caching that were embedded into the base class and things like that. They wanted to reuse those implementations because they weren't implemented in the interface. Yeah, so. and it's it's 
the point of it wasn't to say it's it's good or bad necessarily. Uh, a, a lot of the point of this is like really we just need to remember and understand when we have separate systems that have separate goals which have been collected together. Like we inherit that complexity. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a clear answer. To that. Like you know, do we use derivatives at all for entities? How do we actually do? Is that is that the entire way that they're done is through derivatives? I could suspect possibly, probably no. Uh, maybe. I think no, no. We do it with discovery and the annotations on them. Yeah, I think actually most. Entities uses plugins in kind of weird ways for loading like uh, storage classes and things like that. So um, I don't think it uses it for things like that. No. Yeah, and I remember some. It's been a little while now, but I remember some weird annoyances with trying to inject stuff into it. But yeah, so but there you go. Like it uses it in weird ways. That's another one of those sentences. Like it works as long as nobody does anything stupid. Wow. Which you beat me to. What's that? <laughs> you beat me to saying it. Yeah. It works as long as nobody does anything uh, stupid. There, there you go. So. Yeah, like, I, I would, I would love to see us. <laughs> I would love to see more ornery people defending little fiefdoms uh, where they have, <laughs> as much as that's sort of been a thing that, that's frowned on. Like, I think we could use more of it. I think we could say, you know what? No, no, no. This is what it does. This is all that it does. We're not going to bind it up in a bunch of other stuff. This part is done. So, yeah. Uh, I'll make one more. Yeah. Like, um, the the. Example you used early on where you said you need to implement these three hooks and then change these three. That's basically a description of the entity system in seven, and the current uh, the current entity system is actually a lot less complex, even if it is very complex. Yeah, yeah, I and mean, we've we've made well by by the definition of their by what by what sense of complex and in what way can you give an example of of two considerations that have been released from each other from seven to eight? I'm not all that familiar with seven, but um, you, the hooks aren't in like five different places. You implement a class, it's cohesive. There's an interface that's clearly defined. So there is there's there is a lot of that complexity that's come through, but a lot of it's been identified and kind of simplified out. And that's made it easier, maybe. I, there's a lot of people that seem to think maybe. so. Maybe, well, be, you know, and that's the thing. Like, it's the, the I've, I've actually been reflecting a fair bit on the like, uh, I have to implement hooks in three different places or something like that question, right? It's actually a funny one. I don't think it has anything to do with complexity at all. For an info hook, like, it's annoying. It's not easy. I'm not sure it actually increases complexity to have multiple different info hooks uh, by this definition. Um, and, you know, and I'm not saying this is the only way that you guys should ever talk about complexity ever again. But I think that there is, I think there is more utility in a specific, precise definition of what it is. When you can talk about two orthogonal concerns being braided together, uh, I think it it tells us something more useful because otherwise saying that's complex is basically just like mm, fuck we have to deal with this it's it's not a it's not a productive statement but when you say this is what complex means it becomes incumbent upon you to actually specifically itemize how the things are bound together and that leads pretty directly to questions about well should they be why is that is that okay can we disentangle a little bit can we compose instead of complex like Anybody else? Cool. Thank you all for coming and continuing to hang out for the whole discussion.